this is some super advanced stuff, man. Don't tell nobody about this because this is all of my best secrets. My dudes, what's happening, man? It's Trent here. And the piece that you're looking at on the screen right now was completed in about under six and a half hours. And if you want to understand how I do something like this, I want to encourage you to check out the workshop by my sponsor. That sponsor is actually me. Everybody knows how demanding it is to be a concept artist or an artist in today's modern society, specifically in the video game industry. That is why I've created the legendary Photoshop cheat box. If you wanna double or triple your speed, then you're gonna need to know some of the techniques and tricks that I've developed over the last 20 years of working with Photoshop. I'm gonna show you very concise, step-by-step -step ways to improve your process and to ultimately get greater results in less time making your employers happy, getting you more money, and ultimately even possibly growing your audience online as well. So check out my legendary Photoshop cheat box. Now let's dig into this piece. I wanted to show you guys my layer breakdown. I basically, I've just finished up some projects and I've been very excited to be doing some paintings again. And so I wanted to go through and show you some of the, the layers and some techniques that I've used in this particular piece so that, that might help you with some of your own paintings. Now, first and foremost, I wanna cover some things with the composition. So as you can see, there's a lot of negative space in areas around where the character is, and the contrast of his body being somewhat darker is what's making his shape and silhouette stand out. So even if we were looking at this fairly small, we'd still kind of see this overarching uh, body shape. We might not be able to make out all the details, but we would know the core idea of what this piece is. And having these dragon heads kind of like coming out of the shadows behind him, it's subtle. Notice that the black on this, the darkest area of this background element, is nowhere near the darkness of what we see on the main character because he's closer to the foreground. And in fact, if we wanted to add another layer of depth to this whole thing, we could just go straight up black and put that over the top of this and it would create a little bit of a sense of depth even more so. But what we've got here is when you look at the one back here, this doesn't go any darker than maybe 75% black. Let's compare that with the darkest area on the character. It's like 95% black or it doesn't have to be black. It could just be the values, how dark it gets. So that's one thing that's creating this overarching kind of a uh, composition that really leads our eye to the main character. The second thing that I wanna point out is the flow of the image. We have this flow going through here, which is creating a lot of lines, by the way, even this uh, dragon's body back here is pointing towards the main character. This is pointing towards the main character. This chain is pointing towards the main character. His arm is pointing more towards his head. Uh, his legs are pointing up. Even some of these elements are kind of framing the piece to create a nice flow, overall flow to the whole piece. And that's that's working pretty well. Also, our reds and our saturation right here. By the way, you notice even my note, I'm using a bright red because everything in the piece is cool colors. It's like nice, cool, war, uh, like blues and uh, grays. Whereas uh, this area right here, I could have even gotten a little bit more saturated with it. But you'll notice I really wanted to reserve that for that bright green in his eyes. This is a character who has like a bright green power, okay? So the other thing that really stands out is the contrast in his head. The his, It has white hair and it's getting this kind of a warm light and a little bit of warm light on white hair in a shot that's predominantly all cool colors and gray colors is gonna really drive that attention right where I want the viewer to look, which is at the face. So you've got the combination of all of these arrows pointing towards the character's face, even the cloak, by the way. And you've got all this combination of all this flow, all the lines and the flow of the whole piece all kind of point towards this one area where I want the viewer to look. And sometimes simplicity is the best. If you want to have a more complicated piece, it's cool to have, you know, these, these softer, gentler transitions. They're not high contrast. You see, all this is high contrast in the foreground. But back here, we've got, you could have a lot of like soft transitions in the background so you could have details soft gentle transitions of detail in that background element don't go high contrast back here do not use the same level of black or dark values back here as you have in the foreground see that messes everything up if i would have silhouetted that in 
as fully black. This is one of my challenges with comic book art, by the way. A lot of times they block out, uh, they, they do a color fill on the line art so that you get a sense of range and, and uh, distance. So if, you have a, if you're doing a comic book and you want your background to really look like it's far back there, do a, uh, a lighten layer. Like, look, I'll show you right here. Create a new layer, set it to lighten, and then um, use this, like grab a color that's lighter than the, the color under it. And you see how that pushes it back. It immediately pushes it back, but it also, it was, this would be bad for this piece because it ruins the read the readability on it, but so we're not gonna do that. But uh, if you're doing a background for a comic book, that's the way to make your characters pop out. Keep that line art black on the character, put that line art in the background as a, as a flat color with a lighten layer, something like that. So let's dig through some of my techniques. First of all, you can't really see it very well, but there's a paper texture on here. And that is on my, uh, I even labeled it paper copy, but it's essentially a overlay layer set to about 35% opacity on it. Now, if we turn that off, you see that it loses a little bit of that grainy uh, feel and you might have to zoom in a little bit to see it, but uh, it does add up. And when you're looking at the whole piece, it does feel a little bit more like natural medium when you have something like that. I especially like it because I go for a little bit more of a watercolory look with my images these days. But if I set that to normal you'd, and I set the uh, opacity to 100, you'd see that it's like a paper texture. You'd see that it, it literally is a scanned piece of paper and uh, that's that's gonna give that, that page a little bit more of a, uh, just a little bit of like, as if it's drawn actually on a kind of a paper. Otherwise, Photoshop makes everything very smooth and very clean and crisp, okay? Which might be more of your taste. You may just skip that step altogether, but that's what I'm here for, is to just show you some of my techniques. So uh, here I've got a darken layer. That's for adding some things like details in the background, like this thing that we've got back here, and uh, let's see, where else are we seeing it? By switching it on and off, you can really tell. You can see that I've, I've gone in, and I do this a lot in my um, the last stages of a painting. By the way, the top is always pretty much the last layers that I've added. So in this case, I've got this darkened layer where I'm just adding shadows in. And a lot of times, I'll take the darkest blue. That's kind of your floodlight. It's like what's going on in the rest of the environment. And I'll set that under my darkened layer, and I will fill in my shadows to create a little bit of like anything that I want to back off from being the focus of the image, I kind of fill it in with the shadows. And that's just one technique that I use uh, because I tend to not do, I don't just do darkened layers, one darkened layer, you're going to see a few of them here. So here we have a normal layer that is just for cleaning up details, which is oftentimes something that I'll do right towards the end. I've already got all of my colors worked out. And I think at this point I was zooming in pretty tight. And by the way, towards the end of the video, I'm going to have a time lapse so you can watch how all this came together, obviously, like the details in this dragon head in the background, just adding a little bit more punch to it because my values are established. I know the the, the value range to work in, but I'm not uh, going so crazy with the detail. I could have, if I, as long as I keep the level of value contrast around the same range back here is what you see, the, like the lightest color is this and the darkest color is this. And if you've got that in place, then you can add as much detail as you want. Uh, as long as, you know, you don't want too much detail in areas that aren't your focal point though, okay? Uh, so this is another uh, normal layer, in, in which case I was looking at my character design and I realized that uh, shoulder pad didn't look right. It, I needed to straighten it out, so it was a little wonky. And I just basically just fixed the angle on it. So a lot of times if you want to do a change like that, like let's say that you wanted to change something like this, you make a selection of the whole thing. And then you, I'm on a Mac, so I hold down Shift, Command, and C, and that copies everything down, like all these layers beneath it. And then I hit Command V and it pastes that. It's basically a copy of the flattened uh, image of just the selected area, which, which is different if you just hit, you know, Command Copy or Command C because Command C only copies what's on that layer. But if you wanna do something like that, you copy and, and paste that, that layer uh, flattened version of that. And then what I did was I went in here to filter, liquefy, and then uh, with the liquefy tool, which by the way, I'm on a dual monitor setup here. Let me pull that over. Here we go. What this does is it maps it almost onto flat geometry so you can skew it and stretch it. And this is really great if you're making little adjustments to a character's face or something like that. I did a whole series of videos about some of these uh, techniques and, and tricks, but uh, the liquefy filter 
is super useful. And then what you could do is like erase out the edges that you don't want to use for it. Just a lot of, nothing's permanent with digital. Get that out of your head that, that anything's permanent because it's not. A lot of times I'll do a painting in a totally different color scheme and then I change it at the last minute. <laughs> Use whatever you got, right? Uh, so here we've got another normal layer. I'm guessing, yeah, it's all details. This is where I was starting to dig in on the background and dig in on uh, some adding some, some parts down here to pull your attention back towards the character. I use this spike shape, by the way. Now, if this were a smooth vine or whatever, or uh, a serpent body or whatever, it wouldn't feel nearly as dangerous or deadly. Our, our human brains are wired to accept that spiky triangular shapes are uncomfortable and dangerous. This is why if you're drawing monsters, you're gonna have a lot of shapes like that because monsters have claws and teeth. Like it reminds our subconscious brain of teeth. But if we had, if we had these like rounded shapes, that's not scary or dangerous or deadly at all. So your shape language is going to affect how the player or the viewer feels about the environment or the image that they're looking at. And a lot of there's, there's a lot of contrast to these elements in this image. Like if we look at the hair, lots of spiky shapes imply that he's possibly got, he's a little bit dangerous. Colors can also affect how the viewer feels about it. Blues and cool colors can feel very safe but also very moody. And I wanted something that felt like rainy and dark. So moving on, uh, oh, there was a lot in that one. In fact, I changed the size of the hand and the details on the hand as well. And then with this one, just another normal uh, normal layer where I started to really refine a little bit of these, uh, like the dragon was just really, look at the, how doodled that is. It is just doodled in this guy uh, because I, I, I just wanted to imply that these shadow dragons are coming out of this dark mist. And you can, we're really working backwards here and you can see how the image progressed from very simple and plain as I remove these images or as I remove these layers down to its most simple. Sometimes it's just, oh, I added like a little highlight and I wasn't sure about it. Like in this case, look, this tiny little detail, tiny, tiny little detail. There's nothing there. That didn't need a whole layer. Why did I do that? Well, because I don't think about it. I don't have a refined process in that way. It's, sometimes it's just using whatever I need to get the job done. Here's another case where I was doing that darken layer technique. You'll notice I mean, it's, it's a darken layer on this. Right here, you can change the, whether it's multiply or dissolve or normal or darken. I set that to darken, and then I've gone in and filled in some shadows. Right here, you can see that shadow is casting down from his arm. I wanted that to feel like it's popping out from his body, so it's making it look darker by just doing that darkened shadow color. And the, the shadow color is whatever color is in your environment. Like the lighting that's hitting the shadow areas, there's always light everywhere, always. Otherwise it's totally black. Uh, but if it's not totally black, there's always some light that's bouncing up onto it. So that's like your floodlight. And I use that to fill in my shadow areas, especially if I'm trying to make something pop out. This one had a lot of progress on it. So this is a lot of painting the stone texture that we see over here and really popping out the highlights on the edges and the corners of that. Also adding a little bit of this rim light right here that you can see. I mean, look at when I turn that on and turn it off, it definitely pops. And this is really uh, adding a lot of highlights and things. A lot of times I, I uh, learned how to paint from a guy who did a lot of graffiti and a guy who did a lot of canvas acrylic painting. And the strategy that he would do is he would fill in an object with a solid silhouette and then he would paint in his highlights. So that's exactly what you're seeing here. And painting in the highlights pops out the form. But what colors should I have used? Well, I, I used this to figure out my colors. Now, originally I had done the whole piece in uh, this color scheme, which is just a multiply. We'll get to how I got to this, but it was just a multiply of colors on top of my black and white sketch of line art. And you'll see that in a moment, but this is a gradient map effect. And I've set that gradient map to darken. And what that does is it, it takes this gradient. Now, if I set my gradient map to normal, you'll see this is what it looks like without the darken layer and at hundred percent. This is just one of my gradients. And by the way, if you're curious about my gradients, I do sell them in my workshops. It's go check out my Gumroad. Uh, channel. If you buy my brush pack, it comes with all the gradients that I use. 
And you can see all these different gradients that you could set up, which just change the overall mood and color of a, of a image. This is way too intense, but I do still use it sometimes, by the way. It burns my retinas though, I can't. 53% and then it's at set to darken. Darken, as we just learned earlier in this video, darken is going to take anything that's uh, lighter than the color you're painting it as, and it's going to darken it to the current selected color. And if you have it at set as a gradient map, this is some super advanced stuff, man. Don't tell nobody about this because this is all of my best secrets. Let me tell you something, man. You set up a gradient map as a darken layer, and that's going to give you all of your shadows are going to fit within that color scheme and that mood and that vibe. So most of my gradients, my gradient maps are just vibes that I like. They're, they're color schemes and vibes that I like. So let's see how it looks without all that. Oh man. And there I tried a totally different arm gesture. By the way, a lot of times people will do something like they'll get this far and they immediately start painting in crazy amounts of detail on like, you know, some area like, you know, the hand or something like that. Don't do that, man. No way. You want to back it off and wait until you've got your sketch figured out, you know, before you go and add too much uh, color to anything. And this is before I added all that warm light, by the way. So I was trying this and this one, it felt like you just couldn't see what was, that that was his hand. There are ways to make that pop out if I had like a green light in his hand, but I really wanted the, the green eyes to pop out. So I didn't do that. But this is the way his hand was positioned through a good chunk of the development on this. I would say I was about an hour and a half in when I was at this phase of the painting. And then uh, let's see if we get rid of some of those highlights. These are just edges to really pop out like yeah, I imagine we had some light coming up from this side over here, or what you're seeing over here, and uh, really adding a little bit of turning of form. You can definitely see it right up in the top corner here. Look, or not top corner, but on the top of that arm. Look, look at well, look what happens when we turn that off. Like that just fades into the background. So if you want that arm to pop out, give it a little bit of a rim light, baby. That's how you do that. Um, in this case, I totally wanted that, so that's why I did it. I added my rim lights. So here we can see uh, you've got all this, uh, you know, cape was being painted in. Oh, here I decided very consciously that I wanted a little bit of a gap here between where his cape was flying up. I wanted it to really feel like it's fluttering in the wind. Just lots of movement in the scene, lots of things moving around. Chunks of the pillar, this is the phantom pillar. And if you're watching this, if you read my novels, you're probably wondering a little bit about who this character is and I'm dropping little subtle hints. And the whole point of this piece is to create a little bit of a mystery about this character, which you're not gonna see much of for a little while. This is where I was fixing the face a little bit. I wanted to do something where, look at how cartoony his eyes were, but that's because when I thumbnail everything out, when I sketch everything out, it's usually very zoomed out. I'm usually about this small on the screen while I'm or this is far zoomed out when I'm doing my sketch, my rough sketch. Here you can see where I've added the color dodge, which just adds a little bit of highlight around the body. And this is also controlling where the viewer is gonna look because color dodge, this is a color dodge layer. And color dodge increases your contrast across your whole image. And it also brightens things up. And so you're gonna get a lot of like glow and you're gonna get a lot of like edge lighting and things like that that are gonna pop out when you do something with a color dodge. Just make sure that you're not using a, a too much of a color contrast. Like if you use a warm light for this, let me, let me change the colors by hitting Command U to change the colors. And you can see like, it just muddies things up if you get too many colors going on, unless there is a little bit of a harmony there. Like this wouldn't have been bad. A little bit of green on them like that, but I feel like that would have pulled away from the green glow of the eyes. This is, I wanted the green glow of the eyes to be the central focus. And that's also why I got rid of this green that you see on the phantom pillar over here, by the way. And this, so now we're getting into like, this is what the sketch looks like. You know, uh, this is when, this is one layer where I just started adding compositional elements and really working out how that chain was gonna be flying. And then you can see I had like this whole like S thing going on through the image to create. I wanted to feel like a swirl is going on around him. And this is the big one, I mean, this is the big one where I literally just did a, a uh, gradient, not a gradient map, but a gradient. And if you look up here, you can do this. You select this and then you select a color scheme or a, uh, a color gradient that you want to do. And then you drag it and let go. And that's set to a multiply layer. So it's just going to multiply on top of all of my line art sketch that I've got underneath it, which is this. So this, what you're seeing right here is the rough thumbnail sketch 
And this took me, I wanna say 10, maybe 10 to 12 minutes to just kind of rough in the body. And I, I think I was, uh, I was pulling some inspiration from some DVD covers or something like that for a pose, but I wanted something that just looked like this almost vampiric kind of a monstrosity of a humanoid. And so like, that's where we are. That's, that's all the layers. Everything else down here is just, like this is a grayscale version of the same thing, you know? I just zoomed it down or scaled it down a little bit. His head was too big and there was a little bit of figuring out the angle of the torso. So as you can see, we've worked backwards through all of the layers and I've dissected how a lot of these pieces work together to create this image, but there's still some missing information. So I wanna show you the time-lapse. So what you're gonna see in the next few minutes is the time-lapse working from the very beginning all the way to the end. You're gonna see me turning the torso and like trying different positions for the arm and using the transform tool on my rough sketch to work out my groundwork and my layout and my composition before I go and put any time into rendering anything. And I'll catch up with you at the end of the time lapse for a few final thoughts on uh, on this piece, okay?
that is the doomed Raziel painting that I did. Again, it took about six to six and a half hours. This, this one went pretty smoothly, pretty fast. Now you can, of course, put way more time into a piece like this if you wanted to. I didn't have a deadline, but I certainly captured the vision of what I wanted to do when I set out to start to do the piece. I may add a little bit to it later before it goes to print. I don't know yet, but uh, the point being, you can get pretty fast results if you follow some of the processes. Hopefully you got some things out of this video that you can apply to your own process to speed you up as well. Again, if you really wanna double your speed with very step-by-step -step, uh, processes, you can check out that legendary Photoshop cheat box. And dudes, every week I'm here with uh, career advice for concept artists working in the video game industry or comic books. And I also answer questions that you might have about being an artist or going completely independent. So leave those questions in the comments below the video. I'm here every Wednesday and sometimes more. So until next time, I'll catch you on the bond and ciao baby. Oh yeah.